It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce the last speaker for uh, this, this symposium. And one of the great pleasures that, that, that I have throughout the year is to chair the, the John Dirks Canada Global Health Award. And every year we are really presented with a, just a wonderful feast of uh, outstanding candidates. And I must say last year when we reviewed the, the list of candidates, uh, it was an easy choice. And it was an easy choice uh, for two reasons. One was the stature of the candidate, who I'll talk for, about in one second. But secondly, because of uh, his area of, of research and interest, which is mental health. Um, and these awards, as I said at the outset, really are a signal of the importance of this an area of research. And it's probably no area of research that can be more important from a global point of view than mental health, an area that has been historically um, underserved, under uh, noticed, um, and our, our, in our winner this year, I was gonna say our candidate, but our winner this year um, has really been the person in the world who has brought uh, mental health to the fore as an important global health issue. And, and his name is Dr. Vikram Patel. Uh, he's the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health uh, and Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard. Uh, he's also a professor in the School of Public Health at Harvard. He's an honorary professor of Me Global Mental Health Center for Global Mental Health at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. He's an adjunct professor in India, and he's co-founder of Sangath India. He's been awarded the Global Health Award for his world-leading research in global mental health, generating knowledge on the burden and determinants of mental health problems in low- and middle-income countries, and pioneering approaches for the prevention and treatment of mental health in low-resource settings. Dr. Patel. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, can I just say uh, um, what an honor it is to receive this award. Um, in the last talk, we moved from molecules to cells. Uh, in my talk, we'll move from cells to people. Um, I think um, it's, it's a really interesting moment for me to be following on as the last speaker. Um, I was so enthralled by the basic science we heard. And I hope um, you recognize that we now move from discovery science, which is what you've heard about in the last six talks, uh, to delivery science. Not a kind of science that has been historically recognized as a form of science. And I want to thank the, the Gaidner Foundation not only for recognizing delivery science as just as complex uh, as discovery science, just as important as uh, discovery science, but especially today recognizing also that mental health is one of the critical areas of health and medicine uh, that needs to be addressed in the global context. In fact, as I was giving some of my talks in, uh, to students uh, uh, in a couple of places, uh, thanks to the, uh, the program that the Gaidner Foundation had set up, I realized also that mental health is an issue that immediately connects uh, with young people in particular, but also it's the quintessential global health subject because in some respects, all countries are developing uh, when it comes to mental health. I want to start really uh, uh, by a little, uh, I don't actually have very colorful uh, uh, microscopic pictures. What I do as I work in global health is this is, this is the picture that I start with, a, a map of the world to give you a little bit of the story um, uh, that I have had since the beginning of my career as a medical student back in India. And that uh, there you can see is the uh, very well named uh, for a post-colonial country, the King Edward Memorial Hospital uh, in Mumbai. Uh, which was then considered one of the best medical schools in the country. At the end of my medical training, I got a Rhodes Scholarship that took me to Britain. And after completing a research degree uh, in, in what was then clinical neuroscience, um, I then moved to London where I trained in psychiatry at that building, which is the Maudsley Hospital, which is often considered one of the, uh, the leading centers for psychiatric training in the world. So up until now, I had only experienced all my medical and psychiatric training in excellent institutions in which there were plenty of medical professionals and we in really approach individual health and disease uh, from a very narrow biological framework. Wanderlust took me to the other end of the world in Australia where I suddenly began to challenge some of these, uh, these assumptions in my training. I found myself working not at the glitzy opera house end of the city, but near the Blue Mountains, uh, uh, a part of Sydney that was curiously, at least curiously at that time for me, was called Blackdown. Uh, and I discovered, of course, why it was called Blackdown. Uh, it happened to be the place where most of the Aboriginal people of Australia who had made Sydney their home uh, actually lived. 
It was very clear to me as I worked in this community where I encountered very high levels of the burden of self-harm, of alcoholism, of violence, and, and suicide, that a very narrow biological framework or a framework that only looked at individual life experiences couldn't fully explain what I was actually dealing with. And that I was introduced then through the writings of people like Ernest Hunter, whose book you see here on the slide, uh, with the notions of historical trauma, something that, of course, no medical training uh, had actually prepared me for. Again, Wanderlust took me to another end of the world in Zimbabwe, where I spent two years doing my doctoral work. Uh, and here I found myself, again, in a completely new context which challenged everything I had been trained in. Uh, there were fewer psychiatrists in the whole country as compared to the number of psychiatrists and other specialists in the corridor of my hospital in London. And it turned out that everything I had been trained in how we diagnose and deliver care for people with mental health problems had to be parked in a suitcase, and I had to start all over again thinking about how one would actually address mental health problems in such contexts. I returned to India in 1996, where I set up the non-governmental organization Sangat, uh, which has really been my primary effect around for all the science that you hear about today. I also was very fortunate to have support from 1996 onwards right till today from the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and thanks to that, I got a professorship at the Center for Global Mental Health, which I co-founded uh, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, and it's been this partnership between the London School and Sangha that has really generated uh, uh, most of my work. Through the London School, I was uh, in a very unique opportunity to start mentoring programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. Eugene Kenyanda was one of my mentees who has now gone on to lead one of the largest programs of research on HIV uh, and mental health, particularly affecting children. A few years later, I uh, was fortunate enough to get a large award from the UK government to start examining how we could integrate mental health care in five different countries, working with ministries of health, leading to the prime consortium and in April 2017, I finally succumbed to the American dream uh, and actually joined Harvard Medical School and have launched last year uh, Global Mental Health at Harvard. Now, when I started my journey 25 years ago um, in Zimbabwe, um, it was impossible to excite anyone about the subject of mental health and particularly mental health in a developing country context, which is, of course, the euphemism for global health then. And these are some of the issues, some of the questions that I was challenged with. Mental illness is a cultural construction of white, westernized, urban, affluent people. Does it really translate, all these concepts, do they really translate to non-Western settings? Aren't we just medicalizing social suffering when we apply labels to do with mental illness? Don't poor people have more important things to worry about than their mental health? And can poor countries actually address mental health problems with the scarce resources they have? My work has really tried to address some of these questions and critiques, and I have to say, I myself, when I started off in this career, actually also harbored some of these skeptical ideas. I had been trained also in medical anthropology, and I also questioned, in fact, some of the biomedical paradigms uh, that I had been trained in, in psychiatry and medicine more generally. So my first body of work is really a body that t tended to combine epidemiological sciences with qualitative and anthropological sciences. In this slide, you will see a few examples of work that I did that involved examining the cross-cultural relevance of mental health problems, firstly by working with traditional healers in Zimbabwe, listening to people who had been affected by mental health problems, getting deep into their lives to understand how these problems were experienced, in this case, mothers with depression and women who had been affected by civil war, well, conflict, I should say, uh, in the state of Gujarat and West India in the early 2000s. By examining how mental health problems, including mental retardation, as it was called then, were experienced in what was then the poorest country in the world, Mozambique, working with the government and with communities, uh, this was an important piece of work for me because I was also working in a society that had just come out of a decades-long protracted civil war. And understanding better how discrimination and stigma affected people with mental health problems, in this case, a study with families who were living with an individual affected by schizophrenia. The second important kind of research endeavor was trying to link mental health with established global health priorities, even if mental health problems were not in, of, in and of themselves sufficiently important in the minds of global health leaders. Uh, perhaps by demonstrating the relevance of mental health to established priorities, I might make the case that mental health problems were worthy of our compassion. <laughs> 
So my earliest work really examined the relationship between mental health problems and infant undernutrition, in this case maternal depression, and infant undernutrition and stunting, a very widely accepted global health priority. This study was then replicated in more than 50 other countries, and today it is widely accepted that postnatal depression is one of the leading modifiable causes of stunting in young children. I also was very interested in examining uh, what was then a very important concern in women's reproductive and sexual health, particularly in the context of the unfolding HIV epidemic. Here is a piece of work I did in West Africa examining childbirth, uh, and in particular child loss uh, on women's mental health. But this particular paper might intrigue some of you here. This was a very interesting program of work for me because at the time, because of the concerns around HIV AIDS and the concerns that sexually transmitted infections were essentially a proxy for sexual risk for HIV AIDS, there was a tendency to assume that genital complaints in women were because of sexually transmitted infections. Of course, this had profound implications not only for women's personal lives, but you can imagine their relationships with their husbands. So we began a program of work to investigate whether the very high prevalence of sexual complaints in women, which was being seen at that time in India as a hallmark for what was an impending HIV pandemic, were actually due to STIs. And this piece of work demonstrated, in fact, that there was absolutely no relationship between a bacterial con con confirmation of an STI and women's complaints. Instead, of course, these complaints were somatic equivalents of interpersonal problems, domestic violence, and frank depression. Similarly, we've looked at the examination of the relationship between HIV and mental health in Africa, between depression and a variety of other mental health problems and chronic diseases. This was work done in 60 countries that we showed sh that if you had diabetes or cardiovascular disease, if depression coexisted with that, your levels of disability were almost quadrupled. Of course, global health has been largely been driven by diseases that kill, and there was a time when we thought that mental health problems didn't kill. This work that I did with Prabhat Jha, who's in fact based here in, in Toronto, demonstrated that in fact mental health problems do kill, and epic numbers. Suicide today is now the leading cause of death in young people in India, and this was the first study to demonstrate that. The third kind of driver for global health was to do with social determinants, in particular poverty and gender inequity. My work has mapped how, for example, people living in poverty are more likely to develop mental health problems. Women who live in situations of gender disadvantage are more likely to develop mental health problems. And that one of the most important drivers of suicide in young people, and indeed across uh, uh, the different uh, subgroups in the population, is to do with interpersonal violence. But not only have we been able to demonstrate that poverty and other forms of deprivation are associated uh, with poor mental health, but I've also been very interested to examine how when you suffer mental health problems, whether you're more likely to slide into poverty. And in this work, we were able to show that when compared with a range of priority medical conditions in women, only one, depression, was associated with catastrophic health expenditure. So through this body of the early phase of my work, we were able to show that mental health problems were real causes of suffering in very diverse cultural and social contexts. They were profoundly associated with health and social outcomes, and there were vicious cycles of disadvantage. I remember presenting this evidence in a room much like this at the World Bank, thinking that this would be sufficiently strong evidence for the World Bank to prioritize mental health in its health portfolio. But no. I was told, I'm sorry, Dr. Patel, all of the science is very interesting, but we don't really care because you cannot demonstrate that there's anything we can do to address mental health problems in low resource settings. Thus began a second phase of my career in which I borrowed heavily from the playbook of my colleagues in global health, particularly HIV AIDS and maternal health, who had begun to experiment in the real world in using alternative human providers to pr deliver clinically proven interventions, in particular, community health workers. Over the last 10 or 15 years, I've experimented with exactly this approach to deliver mental health interventions and demonstrated that we could similarly do the same thing in the mental health area. We've shown this for people with dementia, for people with schizophrenia, and more excitingly, over the last 10 years, in fact, even redefined the nature of the clinical interventions, making them exceedingly brief and highly mechanistically informed. For example, for children with autism, work that is led by my wife, Gary, who is sitting here today, 
For people with severe depression, the briefest treatment available today for depression, and one now that is being reverse engineered thanks to PCORI grant for delivery here in Toronto, as well as two North American sites, may be a rare example of a treatment development work that actually began in the global south and is now influencing healthcare research in the global north for alcohol problems and perinatal depression. This body of evidence is now so large, we have more than 100 randomized controlled trials from very diverse settings. These are just some examples of systematic reviews led by my mentees in a variety of different institutions around the world. This is the other interesting thing about global health, of course, which is different, I think, from what we've heard before. Our labs are not in single buildings or in certain institutions. They're actually pretty diffuse, amorphous. They actually occur in a variety of different contexts and institutions around the world. And you will recognize many, many different universities that I have had the fortune of working with younger researchers uh, with uh, in mentoring this program of work. We're also beginning to actually demonstrate the effectiveness of these sorts of approaches for prevention. These are two examples of recent work of mine that demonstrated how we could prevent depression occurring in older people living with chronic conditions such as cancer uh, and other painful conditions. But perhaps it's the lower paper that is really exciting for me because for the first time, we now have evidence that by altering environments, the pathology lies not just so much in our brains. Of course, all mental health problems are finally mediated by brain circuits but the actual triggers lie in our social environments as we were able to show in this large randomized control trial that was targeting not the individual, but the school environments that young people found themselves in, in one of the poorest communities in India. Also interestingly, of course, this particular uh, social theory was being tested simultaneously in Britain, uh, and both the papers were published in the Lancet the same week, demonstrating that there is also a very important science that really addresses mechanisms that are operating in our social environments. This body of work has redefined mental health care. What the composition of mental health care is, for example, that you do not need a diagnosis to receive interventions, or that you need to address both the clinical features of the condition as well as the social determinants, where mental health care can be provided, moving away from hospitals to communities and even people's own homes, who can be a mental health provider, revolutionizing the idea that providers don't necessarily have to be MDs and PhDs, and how this is provided, building the foundation of the base of a mental health care system. This science has led, in my mind, to one of the most exciting disciplines in global health, global mental health, and in order to really excite a variety of different audiences and stakeholders, much like as we heard in one of our earlier talks, it's been one of my missions to communicate the science to a wide range of stakeholders. I've been working very closely with the Academy, particularly the Global Health Academy, by publishing our findings in journals that global health leaders would read, such as The Lancet, by working with research funders, I co-chaired the NIH's Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health, which was a research priority setting exercise, and by working with developing materials for students of global health who are interested in global mental health. In global health, it's very important for us also to make sure that our science is adopted by policymakers and by practitioners. I work with the World Health Organization to develop clinical treatment guidelines for people with mental and neurological disorders. We have been documenting, thanks with the support from Grand Challenges Canada, more than 150 innovative delivery models for mental health from prevention to treatment and recovery across low resource settings in both northern and southern countries. I've developed clinical treatment manuals for frontline workers who can use this science in their everyday work. I worked with the government of India to draft India's first national mental health policy and at the global policy level with the World Bank and the World Health Organization to guide governments on how this science can actually be integrated and adopted and finally scaled up in their routine healthcare systems. Ultimately, though, we can only seek change on the ground if we work with civil society. And I was very heavily influenced when I lived in Zimbabwe to first come face to face with the limits of science. In the mid-1990s, as my wife and I worked in Zimbabwe, we were horrified as we saw so many people die on our wards, in her case, pediatrics, in my case, psychiatry. Numbers, produced numbers of people who were dying that we had never encountered before in any other hospital that we had trained in. They were dying, of course, because they were affected by AIDS, 
But they were also dying at a time when antiretroviral dry, uh, drugs had already become widely used in the West. If, if you suffered from AIDS in Canada or the US in the mid-90s, you would be alive today. But if you suffered from AIDS in Southern Africa, you would have died a long time ago. And it struck me that here we had the science about the causative agent of HIV. We had the science on how we could, uh, we could address this agent with these very effective novel drugs. But of course, most people in the world were unable to access the science because people were squabbling about cost and about delivery systems and so on and so forth. We were only able to translate that science into action through the actions of civil society, particularly people living with HIV AIDS. And I've been very heavily inspired by that, so I've worked tirelessly with people affected uh, by mental health problems to enable them, to empower them to be able to make the necessary advocacy in order to make sure that the science that we generate is in fact adopted. This is a, a movement that I co-founded, which has now been led for the last 10 years by people living with mental illness in the Global South. And last year we launched the Global Mental Health Peer Network, whose very name speaks for itself. Recently, I've started working with young people, uh, the demographic that is potentially the most affected by and embraces the subject of mental health the greatest, and this is a program of engagement of the young people that we have been conducting for many years now in India. Perhaps the greatest success for me has been the adoption of mental health as a legitimate global development target in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, published a few years ago. Now you think, and I think, that this might be a good time for me to hang up my boots, um, retire to a cottage somewhere in Canada, or to the beach in Goa where I live. But it's time for me to take a reality check and examine really what is the status of mental health care in the world today. Here I borrow from uh, the work of last year's winners of the John Doug's Gaidner, Canada Gaidner Global Health Award, Chris Murray and Alan Lopez which shows the rising burden, the relative burden of mental and substance use disorders in all countries of the world, regardless of how rich or poor they are, a proportion that has risen by 50% in the last 25 years. This rising proportion is due to many reasons, one of which is because of our utter failure to address mental health problems, while we've done pretty well with a lot of other human diseases. During this period, suicide has now become the leading cause of death in young people in many countries. Last week, the US CDC released astonishing data showing that suicide mortality in young Americans has doubled in 10 years. Think for a moment if this was any other cause of death and what the reaction of society would be. During the last 10 years, more young Americans have died due to substance abuse than due to any other cause. And of course, you're also seeing similar patterns of mortality in young people in most countries around the world. The coverage of even the minimally effective treatments for mood, anxiety, and substance use disorders are astonishingly low in the low and middle income countries. More than 90% of the world's people do not receive these treatments. But incredibly, even in the richest countries of the world, the numbers are not too impressive. More than 50% don't. And this is what mental health care continues to look like in many, many parts of the world. Images such as this are, of course, historical now in countries like Canada and the US. But in countries like Canada and the US, and particularly I can speak from an American perspective, we replaced prison-like hospitals with prisons themselves. And so today, there are more people with serious mental illness residing in American prisons than there are in healthcare institutions. One of the very important reasons for this, this really chronic failure to respond to the needs of mental health care, but also to respond to the incredible science we have, is because we don't spend enough. This is a slide that simply shows you the burden of mental health problems in different countries of the world as a proportion of the overall burden of disease, and this shows you how much these countries spend as a fraction of their health care budget. It's a very clear message. All countries are underperforming or developing when it comes to mental health care. And this is the kind of a generosity uh, that rich countries have towards helping build the mental health care system of the poorest countries in the world. This shows you the development dollars that we donate to the poorest countries according to disease areas. And as you can see, as far as mental health goes, it doesn't even register uh, on this particular chart of the dollars in million per burden of disease metric. I want to end then by just thinking about what this means for me as a scientist. It clearly isn't time for me to hang up my boots.
A few years ago, I, I started working with Richard Horton at The Lancet. We brought together 28 uh, of the world's leading global mental health researchers to really address what we need to do to shift the needle uh, around mental health care around the world. We really had to focus on human suffering. And while we had focused to a large extent on clinical care, it was very obvious to us that we needed to go way beyond that. We needed to start addressing questions of quality, and by quality we needed to emphasize the science that I described to you earlier, that quality of care did not involve hospitals and doctors necessarily, but in fact it involved building a community-facing healthcare system that empowered community-based providers to deliver psychosocial interventions as the first point of care. We needed to abandon the idea that just because we didn't have a bed net or vaccines, Therefore, it meant we couldn't do anything to prevent mental health problems. There was such a robust evidence base now backed by developmental neuroscience that demonstrated that harmful environments in early childhood explained why childhood adversity is the single most important risk factor for poor mental health. And we needed to embrace the complexity of environmental interventions rather than be constantly fooled into thinking that because we didn't have a vaccine, therefore we could do nothing to prevent. And we needed to really bridge the credibility gap by addressing what communities and people with a lived experience wanted. In the end, what I hope to do in my work now in Harvard is to try and address these different kinds of barriers through a series of different in interventions that go beyond just science, creating the tools and products that we need to empower governments and communities to actually adopt the science in the real world. Here you can see some examples of that. To build a digital platform that leverages the power of the digital world to build the frontline workforce that we need to deliver evidence-based interventions. To help build leadership capacity in healthcare systems to scale up, to use the resources they have in a more science-informed way. To use new metrics to help governments and donors to evaluate the impact of their investments. To string together the variety of interventions that we know can help prevent the onset of mental health problems focusing on early childhood and adolescence, and to engage people with a lived experience to be right at the center of our efforts to plan, to deliver, and to evaluate mental health interventions. In the end, oops, there's a little gremlin there. In the end, the moral imperative for mental health and sustainable development is that everyone must have the right to be protected from harms to their mental health. And here I'm thinking particularly about children who live in difficult circumstances, but also indigenous peoples who have been essentially robbed of the historical, uh, cultural uh, 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 traditions, and people who have effect been affected by war and conflict. And when one is affected by a mental health problem, we should demand the right to quality care of our choice in the same kind of way that we respect the right of people with physical health problems and to a right of life with dignity and respect. I want to end by again acknowledging uh, I have literally hundreds of people that I worked with in my life uh, who, and I can't possibly name them all, but I did want to really acknowledge the people who supported this work. And in particular, I want to say something about the Wellcome Trust. Um, and I say this because when the Wellcome Trust first invested in me, in my work way back in 1995, it would have been impossible to find a research funder who would take such a risky step. Um, and I think this says something to me now that I serve on the, on the Wellcome Trust panel, along with one of the other Gaitner awardees here, um, is the beauty of how it feels to give young people a chance with a slightly crazy idea to take a risk as a research funder. Because if we're ever going to take risks with science, it's when you're young. By the time you reach my stage, it's all incremental. But if you're going to make ex exponential discoveries, they're going to happen when you're much younger. And it's so important for research funders to do the, actually exactly what I benefited from, from the Wellcome Trust. I also want to acknowledge the MacArthur Foundation it supported my adolescent work for more than two and a half decades, and a variety of other funders that have helped me greatly. But most of all, I want to thank now the Gaidner Foundation for putting mental health right bang in the center of the global health agenda. Thank you very much.